I'm Caroline Dowd Higgins. Thanks so much for listening to Your Working Life, my podcast series featuring thought leaders in the career and personal growth arena. I know that you spend a significant portion of your life at work, so I'm on a mission to provide you with tools, inspiration, and resources so you can enjoy your career and love your life. And I'm very excited to welcome my very special guest to the show, Graham Cowan. Graham, welcome so much to the show today. Thanks for having me, Caroline. You're welcome. And I want to tell our audience a little bit more about you. Graham Cowan is the author of Back from the Brink, True Stories and Practical Help for Overcoming Depression and Bipolar Disorder. Graham is also a speaker who helps people build their resilience, well-being, and performance. Despite spending most of his career as a senior executive in Sydney, Australia, with organizations like Johnson & Johnson, Pfizer, and A.T. Kearney, Graham has struggled with depression for more than 20 years. Graham reemerged with not just a best-selling Australian book series, to his name, but a new attitude toward the way individuals approach recovery. And he's also the author of an extraordinary report called The Elephant in the Boardroom, Getting Mentally Fit for Work. And Graham, I'm really excited that you're with me today, and I'm eager to unpack your book and the report and some wonderful resources that you have to share. Terrific. So, Graham, let's get started. Why are people reluctant to talk about stress and particularly depression in their workplace? Well, unfortunately, there is still a great deal of stigma associated with uh, depression and anxiety disorders in the workplace. And this really came out, I I did a, um, a survey last year which produced a report called The Elephant in the Boardroom. And what we found in that was that 86% of people that are going through depression and anxiety would rather suffer in silence and discuss it with their, their work colleagues. So, And yet it's been shown that, that depression, anxiety and stress disorders contribute 34% of lost productivity through absenteeism and presenteeism. So here you have the largest contributor to lost productivity and Almost 9 out of 10 are reluctant to talk about it. Wow, wow. You know, you talk a little bit about work tribes, right, work groups. First of all, explain that term to us first. And then my question as a follow-up, do these tribes have moods as well? Yeah, a tribe is described as as a, a group of people from 20 to 150, and it really goes to anthropological work, which shows that that is the, the largest size of a, of a natural group. And in organizations, tribes have huge influence. They have more influence than policies. They have more influence than, than the CEO. It's the people around you that really shape what is, uh, you know, what's expected in terms of quality, behavior, productivity, all those things. And I've uh, collaborated for a while with a um, uh, a best-selling author called Dave Logan, who wrote a book called Tribal Leadership. And what Dave has been able to show is that there are, I guess, five levels of mood for, for tribes. And they go from uh, life sucks, which represents about 2% of all tribes. This is based on a survey of over 19,000 employees worldwide. 25% fall into the category of my life sucks. So this is where, you know, people feel that they're the victim. They blame management, they blame leadership, they feel they have no control. The next level is probably the biggest uh, level in Western society, and that's I'm great. That's where people are motivated, they are able, but by implication, when you say I'm great, you're also saying, and you're not. And you're not, right. (laughs) So... So this is where, you know, you see rivalry between departments and even within departments. You see people withholding information because they're trying to make themselves look better than than their colleagues. And it it produces probably just as much harm as it does good in an organisation. The fourth level is we're great. And this is where extraordinary things happen. People understand their, their strengths and weaknesses. They understand how to collaborate together. They work in um, larger groups than in the I'm great um, environment. In I'm great, 
people typically work one on one. In the we're great, they work in at least groups of three to make things happen, and that's where you see great productivity. You see well being and performance. And then the fifth group is called life's great, and that's where someone decides to change the world outside their company. And I had a colleague, um, you know, Gavin Larkin, that helped start an initiative in Australia called Are You OK Day. He was the CEO of an advertising agency, but he had lost his father to suicide and decided to create this movement. And uh, in five years, you know, um, more than 75% of Australians are, are aware of this movement and over 26% of people actually asked, are you okay on the day? So they're the five levels that uh, life sucks, my life sucks, I'm great, we're great, life's great. Wow. So, Graham, I want to go back a little bit because we know now, studies and research are telling us that people are more stressed than ever historically trying to balance their work and their lives. And it's really impacting our health and well-being. So why is it important for leaders to balance performance and well-being in the workplace? Well, the main reason is it, it achieves better results. And there was a very extensive study on this done by two McKinsey partners in a book called Beyond Performance. Mm-hmm. And, and what they showed was that Organisations that focus on both performance and well-being are 300% more likely to be in the top quartile of profitability than those that focus on performance alone. So that's the first really, really good reason. And that's reason. huge, yeah. That, yeah. You know, it's a massive reason. And, and the other thing as well, Caroline, is that as you'd be aware, in just about every organisation, they're striving to do more with less. And despite this, this same research by um, contained in Beyond Performance shows that over 70% of change efforts fail to achieve all their objectives. And the reason is, is that leaders fail to adequately plan for well-being. You know, they plan for performance, but they don't consider the, I guess, the morale, the engagement, the mood, the energy levels of the team. They don't plan adequately for that. They assume mm. that because they know what's going on, that other people know what's going on. And, uh, and that's, a, that's a really, really big issue. And the best organisations are ones that are really cognizant of those two things and really strive to achieve both in, in everything they plan and do. Wow. You know, Graham, one of the things that really struck me about your book was the poignancy of the true stories and your ability to give the reader practical help for overcoming depression and or bipolar disorder, for example. So tell us a little bit about about your journey back from the brink, because you um, certainly have overcome issues in your own life. Yeah, I have. I've, I've, um, in, in, I've had a number of episodes of depression in my life, but in 2000, I began an episode, and it was actually after the great, the great tech crash. I was mm-hmm. managing a business that was involved in helping to recruit um, uh, e- e-commerce uh, leaders, and when that collapsed, my life uh, collapsed, and I went through a five-year episode of depression, which my psychiatrist described as worst ever treated. I lost my job, my marriage. I became estranged from my kids, and and uh, and I had over four suicide attempts. So I really, really went to the brink. Yeah. And yeah. and I started a, I guess, a long recovery back, which included um, exercise, regular exercise, of course, good good medical help reaching out to family and friends when I'd been through a really tough time. But what I'd really yearned for when I was struggling were these actual stories of people who had been through tough times and come back. And and because it's one thing to read, uh, you know, facts and figures, but I yearned for stories and I just had this assumption or, or this belief that other people yearned for stories as well. And so that's what I set out to do. And what I found, and I, I did an Australian book first, and one of the people I interviewed was Jeff Gallup, who was the premier or what you call a governor of one of our largest states. And he resigned 
because he was depressed and even his closest colleagues weren't aware of that. And one of the things that just blew me away, I, I went to a book signing in Perth, which is where he's from, where his, his state is, and over 30 people were in the book signing line. At least half said when the Premier of Western Australia talked about his depression, I knew it was okay to talk about my depression. So wow. I just knew wow. the importance of high-profile people in creating those conversations. And, you know, we had the... The tragic extreme of that just recently when um, in the, with uh, Robin Williams taking his life and the extent of the conversations that promoted, that was the one glimmer of light that came from that is it promoted lots of conversations and, you know, how can we better support those people? Um, and so that's what prompted me to do this international book with people from the US like Patrick Kennedy, the son of Ted Kennedy, mm-hmm. like... Um, you know, Alistair Campbell, who was Tony Blair's chief advisor, Trisha Goddard, a talk show host, um, Bob uh, Borstein, the the director of public affairs for Google. You know, these were really competent, really um, successful people, but had all really struggled. You know, depression doesn't discriminate, and they 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 each really describe in their own words about what worked for them in their recovery and and common themes came out of that and uh, I think stories plus I guess practical tips and guidance I think are a, a really good combination for helping people. I agree and and the practical tips and guidance are, are just crucial because so many uh, folks who are listening to our show and reading your book don't know that they're depressed, right? They might have some awareness that something's off, something's not right, but they might not realize that there is a clinical depression. Any thoughts for someone who has um, experienced that up close and personally, Graham, about what the first course of action for an individual should be who's who's concerned, right? Or perhaps a coworker who's concerned about someone else? Yeah, well, it's always natural to have, you know, the odd day, bad day, or, of or a couple of days, you know, these things happen. But clinical clinical depression is where these mo- these moods and, and feelings and physical impacts last for seven days in a row. So it's lower energy, it's, it's sometimes difficulty sleeping, it's loss of appetite, it's loss of libido. They could be a combination of things involved, black thoughts, you know, um, really negative outlook. So if that happens for more than, you know, five, six, seven days, it's really a signal to do something about it. And, uh, of course, going to see your primary physician is a really good place to start. Um, many organisations, particularly large organisations, have employee assistance programs where you can call and discuss that stuff with something. Even going to a website and just doing an anonymous self-test can give you an indication. And, um, you know, there's a website called blackdoginstitute.org.au that, that you know, has a self-test for depression and a self-test for bipolar, which can give you a very good indication about whether you need to seek further help. That's great. What a good resource. Hey, speaking of which, tell us about your free 30-day mood challenge at www.iambackfromthebrink.com. Would you tell us about that? Yeah, well, what I really decided to do was to incorporate um, the stories and the practical tips that I learned from my book, Back from the Brink, and to have it in, in one-day chunks. You know, So people receive one email per day with a story and one practical action to take on that day. So it includes things about how to find a mental health savvy primary physician, how to do, how to access these self-tests, how to exercise when you don't feel like exercising, how to say you're not not okay to loved ones around you. And it basically takes people on a journey. And I was just looking actually at the results of that yesterday and one of the really surprising things to me is that 73% of people that have taken action from those emails report that their mood has improved over that 30-day period. So it's just one practical tip a day, a little step that can make a big difference. Incredible. Now, this is a perfect segue, Graham. You are also the director of Are You OK, uh, which is a foundation, and the slogan is A Conversation Could Change a Life. Tell us more about that. 
Yeah, well, as I mentioned a bit at the start, um, Gavin Larkin, who is a good friend, lost his father to suicide. And um, it happened like 16 years ago, but it was still having a massive impact. He was having to explain to his children why their grandfather, who they never knew, took his life. And so he really thought to himself, what can I do about this? And he just knew that, you know, having a National Suicide Prevention Day just wouldn't pr promote the engagement because people can be th can be threatened or intimidated by raising that sort of subject. And so his brilliance was coming up with a line, a conversation can change a life. And he approached me in 2009. He'd heard about my, my Australian books and said he interested in being involved. And I just knew intuitively how important it was to to do this you know to have this emotional support around you in fact my research of 4000 people shows that the emotional support is the most important part of help seeking and also recovery and so we started it um and we had people like you know Hugh Jackman provided endorsements Simon Baker Australian politician sports people and uh, it it just has become an extraordinary movement there are work programs where you know, people can get posters and guidelines and videos. There's school programs, there's university programs um, where people can access the material for free and they can find it from ruoktheletters.org.au and uh, it's a beautiful, wonderful resource. We had actually one day a year we have an RUOK -OK day and we happened to have it last year, uh, sorry, last week, last uh, Thursday. And uh, I just can't tell you the conversations that created and the number of letters and emails that we've got that's that have said this makes a difference because what we found and this is particularly in the workplace is that people have been reluctant to ask are you okay and we found out that it's because they don't know how to start the conversation and they're also frightened that the person might say they're not okay right and, and then and what? Not, what to, not, not what to do with it yeah yeah so the process that we talk about, the, rec the, the, the flow that we talk about is a four-step process. The first step is to break the ice, talk about the weather, talk about the sport, talk about movies, and then make an observation about a change in behaviour you've seen. It might be someone isolating a lot more, not, not socialising like they normally do on a Friday afternoon, or not going out to coffee with, with girlfriends or go play golf or whatever. And then just say, is everything okay? The second step is to listen without judgment. You know, keep asking questions. We're not asking people to be a counsellor, but the more someone feels understood, the greatest our chance or, or, or capacity to influence them. So keep asking questions to try and understand. Like someone might be turning up for work late, but you might find out it's because they're not sleeping, but... And the reason they're not sleeping is because their son might be an ice addict. You just don't yeah. know. The third step is to encourage action, you know, to encourage them to see their primary physician, to call the EAP service, to go to an anonymous helpline, to call a helpline. And then the fourth step is to follow up to see if they've taken action. And I can't tell you how many emails and letters we've received where just having that sincere conversation has changed a life. That's incredible. You know, Graham, you, you talk about uh, the report, The Elephant in the Boardroom, Getting Mentally Fit for Work, which highlights that 86% of the people with a mood disorder in the workplace would rather suffer in silence than discuss their illness with their colleagues. So walk me through a case study, right, from that report and what that looks like. I worked with a, a very big bank um, in Australia called NAB. It's got about um, 50,000 employees across Australia. And I work with a group in there called the Business Import Performance Group. And I just had that they have given me permission to share this story. Um, and it was a group of about 100 people. And they were like internal consultants within one of the major groups there. And they were responsible for driving greater efficiencies, better customer service, more profitable delivery service. And they'd done an extraordinary job. Um, they had brought down the revenue to, sorry, the cost to revenue basis substantially, which had added hundreds of millions of dollars to the bottom line, but it had come at a cost. And 
that cost had been that they had been overseeing outsourcing and even mergers and retrenchments and a number of the team had become very, very stressed. And so what happened was that the leader there asked me to do a presentation and I shared my story about what had happened. And I also shared my, I guess, my insights about what helped in recovery. The other thing which we had organized in advance was that one of their team members had also been through a depressive episode about 10 years ago, had sought help and recovered. And this guy had gone on to, you know, do three Hawaiian triathlons. And, you know, he was wow. quite an amaz wow. amazing person. But he shared himself about what had happened to him in a stressful period and how he hadn't sought help and what the issue had become. And what that showed, those two conversations really changed the dynamic in the room and it created, I guess, an environment where people could suddenly start talking about what was really happening to them, the impact that stress was having on them and what that could lead to. And then after that, we then subsequently did a, a survey to identify where people scored on the moodometer. And I, I call a moodometer. The moodometer, zero, I like it, yeah. <laughs> zero to ten, zero is where you're really dying, ten is where you can cope with anything. Okay. And, yeah. it, and it came to, up that the group scored as an average about 7.5, which was a really, really good score. But what we found was that seven people actually rated themselves below seven, uh, below five, sorry, on the, on the, on the moodometer. One had even voted themselves as one, which, which basically means that that's someone who's really, really desperate. And so with the, the, the survey, it also identified that, you know, people weren't, um, didn't have good wellbeing strategies. They were working too long hours. They weren't taking advantage of flexible work practices. And so the leadership team facilitated little, little group discussions with ideas from the team about practical things that could be done in the next 90 days. And to cut a long story short, what they identified was really three things to focus on. The first thing was that the leader, the general manager of the group, was going to hold a teleconference every two weeks where he would just take total question and answers about what was happening in the change process within their organisation. And sometimes he knew the answers, sometimes he didn't, but he, he, he would just say that. It was just totally frank. Sometimes he couldn't tell them and he'd say that as well. They were going through big changes, but at least there was a regular conversation. The second thing they did was to start having walking meetings. So they were like a lot of organisations that sat around, a, you know, a boardroom table and had sat down for hours a day doing nothing. And so particularly when the meetings were below four people, they would go outside and just walk while they were having the meeting. So they had physical exercise. I got love outside. that. That's great. <laughs> did that. And then the, the third thing they do was decide to have a pens down day, um, you know, once a month where once a month on the Friday, people could leave at uh, two o'clock and just do stuff that was good for their well-being. It might be to go for a movie or to, you know, have a haircut or a massage or whatever. And they just found that those three things done on a consistent basis um, over the the 90-day period you know, took everyone out of the red zone. All those seven people came out of the red zone and uh, it improved engagement, improved, um, you know, morale and, and mood across the group. So it, it can be done and uh, this is the thing. And one of the one th very other interesting thing that just came in a, in a Harvard study in July, um, Caroline, was a finding that only one out of four employees in a 19,000 employee study believe that their, their leader has a sustainable and a balanced lifestyle. But for those one in four that do, they are 52% more engaged and have 75% higher well-being than the others. So I guess from a leader's perspective, the takeaway message is the most important thing is to take out care of your own resilience, your own well-being. Yes. And yes. that will have a flow-on effect to your team. Excellent. What great, great wisdom to share. Graham, thank you so much. This is extraordinarily helpful. I know our listeners are benefiting as they listen to you. I want to remind them about your extraordinary book, Back from the Brink, 
true stories and practical help for overcoming depression and bipolar disorder. Now tell us, how can we buy the book? Uh, we can just go to Gam Amazon and Google it there or any good bookshop across the U.S. so you can buy it there, no problem. Um, that's, that's easy to find. For the book, The Elephant in the Boardroom, which is a, a free report which I've done, which, which quantifies the cost of stress in the workplace and practical tips to do something about it, that can be accessed at grahamcowan.com.au, which is graham, G-R-A-E-M-E, C-O-W-A-N dot com dot A-U. Excellent. And Graham, you're also on LinkedIn, you're on YouTube, you're on Facebook and Twitter. So I hope that our listeners will connect with you out in the social media space. Thanks very much. I, I really, um, I've just returned from a three-week trip across the U.S. And um, I did over 17 um, interviews on, on TV and other radio stations. And I know that this issue is very much um, relevant to the U.S. as well as it Australia. It is. It absolutely is. And again, I appreciate you sharing your poignant personal story and giving us so many practical tools. And thank you for your time today, Graham. What a joy to get to know you. My pleasure, Caroline. Thanks for having me. Take good care. And I want to thank our listeners for tuning into Your Working Life, where my goal is to help you design your career destiny so it doesn't happen by default. True career and life satisfaction is really possible, and it's time to embrace what you love doing so you can do more of it. I'm Caroline Dowd-Higgins. Take good care. Take good care.